My name is Mary Lloyd Ireland. I'm an orthopedic surgeon working at the University of Kentucky. This presentation is on arthroscopic knee cases. I'll talk about an introduction, comments on what developments we've made, what progress we've made, then talk about meniscal tears, citing specific cases and how the treatment of my cases was done, and then ACL injuries and osteochondral defects and meniscus tears associated with ACL injuries. In arthroscopy, we seek to create a normal milieu, create the rosette, if you will, of the knee when we do a ACL reconstruction as shown on the right. We put the ACL in the correct spot by looking at the patient's anatomic insertions of the anterior cruciate ligament on the femur, and then we fix it. We do make this rosette as normal as we can, but we really put a ligament in, and we can never completely restore the knee to the pre-injury level. There will be advances in techniques where we can grow a ligament. We can hopefully be able to repair the ACL and insert around a membrane or around a wrap certain humors or enzymes that will allow the ACL to heal. That would be ideal. Advances are coming. This is the way we presently do it. When a patient has an effusion, as this gentleman whose car stopped and he had to push his car for a couple of miles, his knee blew up. And so this is what a normal effusion, normal joint fluid looks like. So the way I like to do an aspiration it's pretty easy when they have a hemarthrosis, which is blood in the knee, or they have a effusion, as he did, which is normal appearing joint fluid. You can have them watch if, you, if they don't pass out. I like doing uh, this through the lateral aspect, super patellar pouch, and I use an 18-gauge needle when I'm aspirating or a 22-gauge needle if I'm just injecting. So this is normal appearing joint fluid from overuse from a plica. What does hemarthrosis look like? Again, prep the skin, do this sterilely. I use sterile gloves. And this is a hemarthrosis, meaning there's blood on the inside of the joint. Again, I push the patella lateral, go just behind the patella. And it's pretty easy to tap a knee this way. There are other ways that knees are aspirated. You can do it in a flex position through the fat pad, but that's relatively painful. And in my experience, this is the best way to get into the knee, going lateral behind the patella at the superior aspect of the patella, and somebody else usually pushes the patella medially. We don't routinely aspirate hemarthroses. We do if we're trying to make a diagnosis. If there's fat in there, then there's going to be an intraarticular fracture. But the hemarthrosis typically will recur. If somebody does have a very painful hemarthrosis, aspiration of this can be helpful in pain control and also range of motion. We definitely don't inject steroids in an acute hemarthrosis. This is an example of a knee dislocation. This is an exam under anesthesia. The knee that you really need to be concerned about is the knee that doesn't hurt because all the structures basically are blown. So there's a hole in the balloon of the capsule of the of the knee so then all the fluid leaks out. You can see how he has ecchymosis down the medial aspect of his right leg. And really the only thing that is keeping his leg on is the skin. So this is a positive suck sign, if you will, where the skin gets sucked to the inside of the knee joint. He didn't have any pain. This was a contact injury and he tore his MCL, deep medial capsular structures, ACL, PCL. So the only thing holding him from valgus stress is the skin. Many years ago, we did more osteotomies than we do now. There are different ways to fix these osteotomies. When I was doing my fellowship 30 years ago, this is an example in the upper left of somebody that was a factory worker. He was in his early 40s, so we didn't want to do a total joint, and we did an osteotomy. And the way that the Houston Clinic training was is to do an osteotomy in this way, where the fixation is with a third tubular plate and we just bent the plate and then put a cancellous 
screw across and this healed very well and was a good operation. Now there are different techniques and advances in wedges and doing, instead of doing this is a closing wedge uh, valgus osteotomy, opening wedges are now done and that is better for a improved restoration of normal anatomy, which is what we try to do in all cases. Osteochondritis des desiccans. Then, this is what we used to use. We'd put metal uh, smooth guide wires in, and these would be oftentimes done from outside in or inside out, so these pins would be sticking through the skin. It got to be a very sticky situation, so to speak, a lot of problems with the pin moving um, in the uh, skin and infections, but that's the only devices that we had 30, 40 years ago, so we've made a lot of advances. You can see the probe is where the OCD is hinged, just next to the posterior cruciate ligament, and then this was the best way that we can fix it. Advances in imaging, MRI scans are very helpful to determine if an osteochondritis to secans is loose or not loose. In the olden days, we used to use arthrograms, and we would see if there was any of the dye that went around the bed of the OCD, and that would tell us if it was loose. In these cases, you can see on the bottom, the MRI scan, where there's that uh, radio black line around surrounding the OCD lesion. That means that this is an active lesion and one that we want to try to fix if we can. Typically, the notch is the best view to see an OCD lesion, and the most typical location for these lesions is the lateral aspect of the medial femoral condyle, as in this case. You can see it on the lateral view. It's kind of in the mid portion on the lateral view. So what do we do now with an osteochondritis to secans? We do a fixation. There are different ways to do this. We could do a headless metal screw, which usually has to come out. These are smart nails that are, um, we put a drill in and then basically just hammer in the smart nail after it has been fixed. So we go from the articular side into the bone. You can see us hammering it in now. You can see this OCD lesion has been debrided. You can see it's uh, a basically a circular area and where there's that indentation is where the OCD lesion and the normal medial femoral condyle boundary is. And we would put at least a couple of these in, varying the angle a bit. and these would stay in. This shows us probing the stable OCD lesion that has now been fixed with three smart nails. You can see where the tip of these nails are. The probe does go into the bed of the lesion, but you can see probing this that the lesion is quite stable. You need to make sure that the tip of the smart nail is deep into the cartilage so that it's not prominent because there could be damage to the tibial articular cartilage if you leave it prominent. 